Hello and welcome to the 12th episode of the Mike McNair Revolutionary Strategy Series. Today is Friday the 24th of May 2019 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week we complete our perusal of Chapter 4, War and Revolutionary Strategy. We are joined again this week by Lexi of Swampside Chats and Sophie of Trans Trans Revolution. This week I have to thank two new patrons, Amon Vogler and Comrade Matt, and the existing patrons, Stephen CM and Christopher Carroll, who upped their patronage level. The first Patreon-only podcast will be coming in the next few weeks, so if that floats your boat, or maybe you just like to show the podcast some love, you can join the Patreon gang gang for only $5 a month, which works out at about $1 an episode. When we hit 100 patrons, the Patreon-only podcast will become a fortnightly endeavour. If you'd like to comment on the show, please do so on the YouTube channel, and make sure to like, subscribe and share. You can also join me on Facebook or Twitter. War. Hmm. What is it good for? Deciphering communist strategy. Hmm. Okay, so last week I was in a very tired state and I was being very incoherent and I couldn't understand why I got the wrong gist of what you guys think that McNair was saying. Let me just read this paragraph here because this paragraph threw me threw me for a loop. Okay, let me just read it here. Preparing for defeatism is the subtitle. The war immediately posed a question of state power and the coherence of the armed forces as, in a different way, an internally driven revolutionary crisis or mass strike wave does. But the advocates of the strategy of patience could have prepared the workers' movement and the society as a whole for the fact that this question in the future would be posed. They chose not to. To me, this is a very important one because, well, it remains to be seen for me, like when we get on, we'll see as we pick it forward. But I had the impression that McNair was going for advocating a centrist strategy of pitchens. And in this point here, he says, because the SPD was essentially following a centrist strategy, not a right wing or not a left calm one, but a centrist strategy of patience, that they could have prepared the right wing of their party, seeing these imperial build up and inevitability of war coming in the future, that they could have prepared both the right wing and just like I'm talking about the general party and prepared them in advance, kind of like what Sinn Féin did in Northern Ireland for preparing them for disarmament, you know, and hold the party together. Well, that would have been very much against maybe some of the automatic leanings of some of the people. So to me, this kind of led me to believe that McNair is actually saying that you don't necessarily have to split because you could have prepared people correctly and prevented the split. I don't know if he meant preparing the right wing of the party. I think what he means is the workers movement, like the workers themselves. And maybe I'm mistaken, but I don't think the right could have been saved. But if you prepare the whole mass of workers for it, the right's power won't be the same. You know, if everybody, if the dominant narrative in the workers' movement is, fuck you, we're not fighting an imperial war, the right won't be able to force it on the, on the party. So this was anticipated by some second international theorists, and they were essentially ignored. One of the most important ones ended up being Julius Martov, who... As early as, I think, 1910, realized what a problem that this was going to be in the future. And his faction is known as the Internationalist Mensheviks. He was trying to, like, draw out that there, at some point coming soon, there would be an inter-imperial conflict and the socialist movement's going to shit the bed over it because we're too entwined with Imperium, we're too entwined with the state. Martov is, ends up being the opposition leader is one of the, some of the only mensheviks that accept the october revolution uh, i have tremendous respect for martov uh, he essentially predicts the both of the big beef ups in the second and third internationals and for for his thanks he is buried in history there was a potential for for maintaining like some form of unity without the kind of unity being proposed now it would be a unity of the working class but not necessarily unity of the socialists because some of the socialists are too aligned and too integrated yeah but i suppose like what i'm trying to say is that like 
SPD could have could have kept that split way down. If you look at Sinn Féin in Northern Ireland, they kept the split of the Republican movement, of their movement, right down, whereby the vast majority supported them, even if like 5%, 10% broke off. And it's like, the question there is, if you follow that centre strategy and you have the right and the left in your party, can you dominate and prepare the party in advance to keep your size big enough without splitting in such a way? Because it's actually... In the SPD cracked in what in half or quarter, it just it just disintegrated. I think generally what you're getting at is correct. I think well, if the center had properly prepared the workers' movement to not be on board with this imperialist war, and then the right through a temper tantrum because they're too aligned with the imperialist government, then yeah, you could have kept the split to a minimum. And what it would have really would have looked like was more of a purge but a purging of a small minority that wanted to go all in for imperialism that you probably don't really want in your party to begin with. That That's really what would have been ideal, was instead of having a small section like the Spartacus League trying to like go all in for revolution to support Russia, you would have had the entirety of the German SPD being more strategic about it. This is another point Mc- McNair makes elsewhere, but this issue of the split retroactively gets jammed into the issue of the October revolution. And it's easy to see why they're, you know, events separated only by a few years. It's really in teasing these currents apart that we can answer this question. Like the rest of this bit of chapter here, he kind of starts talking about how as commies, we should be kind of taking our ideas about arming ourselves from the Republican revolutions of Europe and and Paris commune. And, you know, a lot of leftists, myself included, and communists, even like commies have like a lot of kind of queasiness. Certainly about one of the comments I had on the show from last week where like somebody was kind of asking, could we talk more about this? But Hmm. it's interesting. He brings it, he brings it up even here. Like at the end, he kind of makes a jibe at the current left. Let me read this last paragraph. He said, these ideas are neither an innovation from Marxist principles nor a Republican shibboleth. They are a version of the policy Engels urged on the SPD in 1892 to to nine in his series of articles, Can Europe Disarm? Their absence from the political arsenal of the British left is the product of a timid pacifism, which is covered by super revolutionary phrases about rejecting reforming the bourgeois state. Like he's talking about here how you could re we should be trying to as left organizations to basically change the army into basically regional militias that are popularly controlled and got politics and freedom of political speech in and you can organize political parties and trade unions in the military. Trying to get to this idea of where like we should be getting the army not just infiltrated, but also built on a democratic basis. And have them like where the people are in charge of it. And you're not taking top down orders from basically central command who are going to always be doing the behest of capitalists. I think they're even McNair and Ingalls are both taking it even like a step further. Like the army as it stands should be abolished and it should be replaced by a, a form of democratic Republican like militarism where you have the universal conscription and universal training of the workers militias now in my opinion i don't think that means that there isn't some kind of you know central command but i think it should be democratically run and fully recallable as as well as the officers is kind of how i envision it but you're right there is like a lot of queasiness even among so-called revolutionaries about this sort of thing like outside of stalinists you never hear anybody talking about this kind of stuff well stalinists want to recreate a new body of armed men that stands over and above the proletariat. So even they aren't really properly talking about it. Oh, correct. Yeah, but, they're, but they're talking about guns. Yeah. No, right. that's true. That That is a huge problem. Like, Marxists who are critical of Stalinism, in my opinion, really need to get their shit together and stop being such babies about guns. If you don't part- like the police or the bourgeois state as a facet of your politics... How does, as one supposed to problem solve? I know that sounds kind of silly. You know, if if we can't defer 
are issues of, you know, defense or, or I, I don't know what else, any kind of like adjudication. If you can't defer them to this like unit that the whole society is supposed to rely on, but really mostly sees as an antagonist, you have to solve your problems yourself. And that's something that I say this with the most love I can. A lot of us are not equipped to do. One of the things that primitivists and other critical theorists really harp on is the incredible de-skilling of human beings in society. And one of the most interesting and sort of difficult to swallow versions of this is the inability to defend one's own self. <laughs> like that has been stripped. Like, you know, yeah, traditionally there, there are people that could defend themselves and, you know, they would be relied on to defend others. Not everyone could defend themselves. But these days, like I think a lot fewer people can defend themselves probably than before. We have a situation that generates people that are sort of helpless and de-skilled in really essential ways, in, in ways that were almost impossible to conceive of before. And you're right. And as somebody who has like attempted to try to rectify this problem, you run into all sorts of issues, everything from like tanks who want to usurp and wreck your org because they think they have all the answers to abusive men who just like posturing with guns. It's not an easy thing to do in, it, because we are starting from a place of everyone's very de-skilled. But regardless of all that, it's, I think it's incredibly important and something that we shouldn't just give up to the state or shouldn't just give up to mm. Stalinists. I, it, kind of a funny anecdote, there is some communist, quote unquote, who lived outside of the United States, who said something to the effect that only somebody who's psychotic would advocate for bringing back gun rights. <laughs> wow. There is this uh, British left com who's very big on identity politics, usually, who just kind of let that slide by, even though it was basically being called a country bumpkin, a psychotic person, because I thought communists need guns in order to pull off a revolution. Revolution is really just, you know, it's really just a form of psychosis. Really, if you read this Lacan book, well, you'll understand how it's really just a search for the big other. I'm very smart and intelligent. Is it a search for the big show, maybe instead of is, like he's seven <laughs> foot one? He is seven foot one. I'm glad. I'm glad we're uh, talking about the big show. It's been a while since I've thought about him. They used to say that he was the biggest sports entertainer in the world. Wow. Very specific claim. Sports entertainment. Back. I'm listening to that one on the Paris Commune that Jaman did the podcast, mm -hmm. the Revolutions podcast, and it, it's very interesting because this is like these paragraphs talking about like having popular militias. Having, you know, I think in, in France, it was, it was the guard, the National Guard in Paris mm -hmm, that were mm -hmm. became dominated by the working class and they were trained and they had a massive army of stuff. And, you know, they were able to do stuff politically because no one could fuck with them for however right. long it lasted. I, I think it, the, the point is not that uh, commies should just go out and start buying guns. I don't think, <laughs> right, right, right. you know, the point is that like, if we, we want to have a communist revolution succeed, you will need to have commies in the army at every level. You will also need to be trying to get reforms of the military along the lines that he says here, democratic Republican military policy, that th we should be pushing for them. And then when, when an actual, some shit goes down, say if the revolution goes down, you will be prepared at that point. To some so extent. Tom, is what you're saying that we should run to reinstitute conscription. I don't have a problem with conscription. Well, because I think that's the logical conclusion here. If you have a volunteer army, right? Especially in the United States, it probably selects for the least communist and the least libertarian. You will never have the kind of penetration you would need for a revolution. In the officer class, yes, definitely. But in, in, in the grunts, like they're likely just to select for poverty. Well, look, more if, so than it, anything political. Listen, Direct there's there's a Spartan element to some Americans, the, the kind of rugged individualism, a sort of live free or dieism, where even though a lot of them act like that and then you know suck off the armed part of the state at any chance they get, some of them actually make good on hating the fuck out of the state authority structure and would rather be poor than sign up for the military. And there's actually like a, there's a sizable amount of people like that. And pe people that go into the military, I'm not saying that they're in the best part of our society, 
but it's like a, a certain it's a certain slice of the the economy. It's not the very most desperate. There's like a weird cocktail of dynamics that end up selecting for this, but it certainly doesn't create the most revolutionary armed forces. Granted, but I don't think it's just all of just right wing people. Like no more than the British Army is full of right wing British people. It probably has a as a majority. You know, it probably selects slightly more than not. Maybe it's <clears throat> maybe a seventy thirty versus fifty fifty of the population. You know what I mean? But it's not like yeah. ninety ten. There's there's a pretty deep contradiction. How do we mobilize against the bourgeois state while wanting to reintroduce conscription? You know, like the people feel like they're apart from, you know, in my case, the the American state, even if they're they have to deal with it all the time. The reason why they get rid of conscription is because it does actually lead to the working class getting their hands yeah. on weapons and organizing. That's explicitly why they get rid of it. At the end of the day, that's that's the thing that makes the most sense about it from a functionalist way of seeing the state. I, I imagine people have thought had thought that through before. But, you know, certainly people wanted to end conscription. Protesters wanted to end conscription. People wanted to end the draft. There's a, there's a lot of popular discontent with the draft, and for good reason. That's because there was a war. In uh, Sweden and uh, Norway, they, they had it up until, like, the 2000s. I think, do Norway still have conscription? Everybody has to spend a couple of years in the army? You know, my boss is from Norway. He's a couple of, he was a couple of years older than me. He did two or three years in the army. I'm pretty sure Sweden and Norway had it up into the 2000s, whether they still do or not. But like, it's not like they hated that the same way they hated the draft, because you're not going to Vietnam and mm, you know yeah. doing war crimes. Mm. That's, that was more the problem with the draft, more so than you had to join the army for a year. But this is what the American military does. I don't know what the Norwegian military does. We have a thousand mini Vietnams burning at any time, Tom. I understand, but I'm just talking about splitting. The problem yeah, is that they're no, at that, war that makes as opposed sense. to they're in the army. That does make sense. That's why conscription to the in the American context sounds so especially odious. Well, the thing is, if you had cons conscription in the American thing, they probably wouldn't be able to go and do half the things that they currently do with a non-subscription army or would find it difficult to do the same things. No, I think there's something to be said for that. So he goes into a long chapter here where he basically just gives out about trots. He goes on about basically defeatism. And this is the idea that you should you, you should be hoping that you're are advocating for your own side to lose in a war. And he makes this case where Trotsky kind of gone to absurd levels of implementing this type of strategy. So let's have a I don't I don't think we should go through too much. I've highlighted a few interesting lines because it goes go on for about three or four pages. And there's, a, there's an incredibly good paragraph at the end of it that I like. So the intro is like the Trotskyists have made of defeatism something different, not a practical strategic choice with the working classes struggle for power, but a purity test. Let's go on and have a look at some of the purity tests because he goes into some examples here. The false character of Trotsky's 37 line for China is a particularly clear instance. The Kuomintang regime was a government in form which in practice presided over warlordism. It was not an effective, coherent state. In this context, in order to defeat the Japanese invasion, what was needed was to create a state alternative to the KMT pseudo state, the party followed by the mass who fought on two fronts, both against the Japanese and the, the Kuomintang. And as a result, in 1948, were able to take power. To participate actively and in the front lines of the war, as Trotsky argued, would not open the road to the masses, but merely identify the communists, in this case, the Trotskyists, with the failing KMT regime. So a funny little anecdote about this real quick was that uh, Lexi and I were playing a, a game called Hearts of War. Which is Hearts like of a, Iron 4, I believe. This came up, actually, and we were both, well, Lexi in, in particular was like looking up facts about like the Chinese revolution and like the, the Chinese Communist Party involvement in the war against Japan. So a lot of the criticisms that you, I hear against like the early like Maoist Communist Party was that like they went in with the KMT to fight Japan. But as it turns out, they didn't do what Trotsky was advocating for at all. And what they did instead was wage guerrilla war against the Jap Japanese army independent from the KMT. And essentially what the KMT, what they had with the KMT was like a temporary ceasefire that lasted in, throughout World War II. 
I don't know. That was just fascinating to me. And that was like a mistake I made in criticizing the Chinese Communist Party was just saying that, oh, you went in with this like nationalist group or whatever. It's important to say, and this is the reason that they didn't go along with both Stalin and Trotsky's advice here, which is to buddy up with the nationalists, is because they had already done it before and experienced a white terror for their troubles. And so that's why the Chinese communists were not gonna buddy up with the nationalists so quick. They did have this united front, but it was not the kind of, well, I mean, I don't know if it's a united front, you know, it's like a, um, they did have this common cause, but the communists really in that case are a paragon of how to fight on the same side without merging your forces. So he goes on to a big long spiel here about like, he's kind of trying to get to this claim as in like, should we have defended the USSR? He's saying Trotsky said yes, because even though it was a messed up kind of worker state, it was better than capitalism. So we should defend it. And he's trying to pick apart, like, should people have defended the Soviet Union when it invaded Finland and these places prior in the before World War II broke out and fought for, for Russia? This is a great paragraph. So, which one are you saying? In the middle. Now, if it were true. There's a couple here I like. Now, if it were true, if Trotsky claimed that the USSR was a kind of workers' organization, a trade union that had seized power and a strategic gain for the working class in spite of the bad leadership of the Stalinists, then defensism would be broadly justified and it would be equally justified to call its opponents scabs. He loves calling people scabs there. It's the yeah. communist outgroup for those fucking scabs, you know? <laughs> like, know. of course. It's like I'm back in the minor strike. I remember when I was like a kid and I used to be like, the news would come on like in the mid eighties and it'd be the minor strike and there'd be like some miners getting their ass kicked by some cops, truncheons and horses kicking them in the head. And like, Christ. that was what you would hear all the time was like, scabs, scabs being shouted. But um, anyway, here, Soviet defensism would also be clearly a task of the working class in every country, whether imperialist or colonial, and whether at war with the USSR or not. The English would say, even so, would not be completely justified. For example, I do not think that any Trotskyist group supported the 1974 Ulster Workers' Council general strike against the Sunningdale Agreement. So the Sunningdale Agreement in Northern Ireland was a, a kind of like a version of what ended up being the Good Friday Agreement 25 years later. but. It just came too early for the unionist people to be able to kind of accept equality of Catholics and stuff like this. So all of the working class loyalist, uh, the Protestant community went on a general strike in the country against it and it brought it and it basically collapsed it. Now, Oof. in that scenario, they were working class people who brought the, you know, it was a general goddamn strike. But as a leftist, you shouldn't be supporting that that strike. So That must have been disorienting. <laughs> Just because it's workers doing it doesn't mean you should su support it. And he then goes on to try to have apply that kind of argument to the Soviet Union. He kind of thinks you should take it on a case-by-case -case basis. He thinks that Finland, Poland, and the Baltic states do not obviously fall into either case. Well, well, read the so, paragraph before that, though. I fucking love that paragraph. Okay. Nor on a smaller scale have Marxist socialists ever given support to strikes which demand the exclusion of ethnic or religious minorities from the workplace which has occasionally happened. In the case of capitalist attacks on the USSR, like the intervention in 1918 to 21, or like 1941, Soviet defensism would be plainly justified. Where the Stalinist regime used military force against a workers' revolutionary movement, as in NKVD operations in Spain, Soviet defensism would be obviously wrong. Then he goes on to say, the Soviet invasions of Finland, Poland, and the Baltic states in alliance with the Nazi regime would probably not qualify. So this, this paragraph just below, this is a goddamn sick burn. In reality, as they argued in the introduction, Trotsky's assessment was wrong. Given that there were no prospects of the working class taking power back from the bureaucracy, the Stalinist Soviet regime could not be considered as a strategic gain for the working class or in the same light as a trade union. Other things apart, this assessment would apply that the USSR under Stalin should be approached rather as a nationalist Bonapartist regime based on the petty proprietors, i.e. like the Brazilian Vargas regime or in modern times, the Iraqi Baathist regime, but with rhetoric much further left. This would imply a revolutionary defenses policy in some circumstances, 
like the 1941 German invasion, it would not apply such a policy in the case of an agreement with a neighboring imperialist power, Germany, to carve up the smaller states in the locality, Finland, Poland, and the Baltic states. Wow. That's McNair's kind of Stalin equals Saddam. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, like, literally. Yeah. The USSR was Baathist or, you know, it's like Stalin in the USSR equals goddamn Assad. You know, and that's a sick burn. This is like burning the tanks and the Trotskyists all in one go, too, because tanks do support Baathists. It's wild how one could call yourself a Marxist and take on that position, really. Even furthermore, like the primary, like the most popular, most well-known opposition, communist opposition to Stalinism is much more in line with Stalinism than they would care to admit. Yeah, I was kind of flabbergasted when I reread that paragraph today. I was like going, I don't know if that hit me as much the first time. Yeah. You can kind of pass over some things. Sometimes, you know, you're reading a book and you kind of, you, know, you wander through a paragraph and don't take it in. But like that is a terrible indictment of the USSR. McNair is like, this is slash and burn agriculture. He's burning things down in this book. What the hell do people in his sect make of these type of paragraphs? How do they not kick him out? All of the, For, all of the far left in England is essentially truck groups. That's what it well, well, except when they're from Stalinist groups. And from what I understand, the current CPGB came from a dissident newspaper within the original Communist Party of Great Britain. So, and the newspaper was named The Leninist, if I understand this correctly. So that would imply that they're actually coming from a sort of heterodox Stalinist strand. But I, I, I hesitate to call them Stalinist because in the way that McNair uses the term official communist party, official communism, a, a sort of like post-56, you know, post-de-Stalinization uh, kind of uh, communist partyism, a Khrushchevism, you know, if you will. That seems to be like a, the weird sort of center that some Leninist aligned people can sort of worm themselves into the old Leninist tradition somehow using this. And it makes sense if you consider the heritage, but it's, it's very strange. McNair doesn't fit into any of my like preconceived understandings of the background of a, the CPGB PCC, this quote provisional central committee quote, they don't, they don't really fit into my preconceived understandings of leftist groups. They're very weird. He's talking again about uh, defensism. So this is like, what should you do if you're in a colony and, you know, there's some war going on by an imperial power? And he's shown how the Trotskyist groups have taken it to such an extreme. Listen to this paragraph. The Spartacus leagues and the subsparts might be said to have reduced this idea to absurdity when they argued that the Afghan communists should join with the Taliban who would immediately shoot them to fight U.S. imperialism, a policy of revolutionary suicide, which might have been borrowed from Monty Python's Judean People's Front crack suicide squad. I fucking love that line. I can't believe he referenced fucking Monty Python. But that is the milieu that he's talking about. And it goes on. But the absurdity crown will surely belong to the British SWP comrades who claim their revolutionary credentials by calling for victory to the Iraqi resistance. This same Socialist Worker Party has for the last 20 years resolutely opposed in the name of broad unity any political agitation either for a democratic republican military policy or for organised workers self-defence. Today, it's revolutionary defeatist, supposedly anti-imperialist alliance with political Islam involves sacrificing fundamentals of democratic, let alone socialist policy. Burning the SWP for like, yeah, if you're in the colonies, you can do what we're, we can't make the case we're doing at home. And they're getting into bed with like a retrograde <laughs> political is Islam to do it. Yeah, this is, it's truly something to behold. This chapter was, I thought when I read the first time, I, I thought it was, uh, it's, it's McNair just kind of going a bit crazy with his kind mm -hmm. of historical stuff. The second time I read it, I really liked it. I think that's a great chapter. I'm excited to kind of, uh, when we finish this, we should do an interview with him. What are general thoughts on that chapter then? Dab on the haters. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I love McNair's nuance with respect to the Russian Revolution, to the split 
between the second international and uh, from you know, Lenin and you know even Lenin's like refinement of the split that the, uh, that the Zimmerwald left uh, started and that sort of thing in all the ways that like you could be you know prob- politically problematic and get into McNair. I feel like a lot of this stuff is the jump off where if you're a Leninist, you can look at McNair and still still essentially use this stuff in a motivated way because he makes such a strong defense of a fundamental Marxian point that Lenin gets right in in his like early little revolutionary twilight. He gets it very correct like right off the bat before going very wrong. (laughs) And because McNair is putting a lot of weight into this fundamental point, a lot of Leninists don't mind McNair, (laughs) despite the overall thrust of what he's saying. I mean, I think you're absolutely right, but but it has to be said that at a certain point when you're reading that paragraph about the Cheka and all that, like that's where that's like, you have to very, very intentionally ignore all that to like, maintain a Soviet defenses position. Thinking charitably about people who call themselves defenses and also take up McNair, I think they would ultimately agree that it's on a case by case basis on what, what, where you defend the Soviet Union or not. Even with that said, it seems like there's this tendency to, and in, in g- generally speaking, defend Leninism and the Soviet Union as a whole which I don't yeah. think is shared by McNair. And you have to intentionally ignore that to be that kind of Leninist and also, you know, call yourself a, a, a neo Kotskian in this tradition. Yeah, it's either that I've, I'm have i truly reading something into McNair that should be there, that a conclusion that he should have come to that he did not, which I just have too much respect for him to think this, or that, yes, these, these people are, have simply distorted as they do with great texts, what is being said here. Or they can appropriate enough of it and then just blot it out, blot it out logically, blot it out, blot out his, his historical claims, blot out his equivalency of the betrayals of the Bolsheviks to the right, uh, you know, uh, in social democracy. That's very damning. I don't know. I don't know. I, don't, I think he did come to the conclusion in that paragraph about it seems pretty explicit there when he's talking about it amounts to betrayal. Like it's not, it's not obscured. It's pretty clearly stated, I think. And ultimately the gist I take from this is that, you know, Stalinism is a right wing socialist strategy and it's not as clearly stated, but the comparison of Trotskyism to Stalinism to me kind of signals that it's difficult to be a Leninist and not fall into like, soft tank tendencies you know what i mean and i think we've seen that borne out soft tank in this case just being the general defensism that de facto by default you're just gonna defend i think that's something that we as communists basically don't have a lot to gain from In, in the same way that you know the correct position on you know like for mcnair for imperialism was not to cheer on this or that anti-imperialist movement abroad because of the way that that will get sucked into inter-imperialist politics. You might cheer on an anti-imperialist movement against the Americans, not because you care about the people's national liberation, but because you're Russia and you're a, a global strategic enemy of the United States or something. And that those more powerful factors will get in the way so that what you should do is try to lobby for your own if you are an imperialist country and it's in you know it's invading like colonies you should of course be lobbying for your country to lose or withdraw <laughs> in those colonies and if you're in a colonized country yeah obviously you have s- some sense of like having that strategic question of how to maintain a working class character of organization while fighting the imperial power. There's another two clauses to that sentence that I, I don't remember where that was going. But I, well, I thought it was worth stating that he did actually come to a conclusion about what the right strategy was, that you don't just adopt this as some kind of shibboleth, that there are like circumstances in which you you know will defend your, quote, country, right? 
and that the U S left or other otherwise, like if your country isn't implicated as the U S left often is, or as the United States often is in the invasion, in the colonization of people, then it's, you would be hard pressed to comment on it without getting dragged into global geopolitics. And maybe I guess what I was going for is that that's what a lot of these like sort of stuff, Stalinists, like defensist kind of politics come from. One thing it's interesting in it, because he does kind of accuse like Lenin and those of, what was the word you used? Uh, betraying the socialist movement. Did he say that? Betrayal. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the word yeah. he used? Betrayal. You know, he's not saying that they made a mistake, which it seems quite a, a hard, that's a pretty sick burn too. You know, there's a difference between they, they messed it up and a betrayal. And I think we should be think people should think hard on that, as in like this idea of if you jump too quick, that's as much a betrayal as jumping in with the other class. That's his general point. The, the, the right wing went for the war and they betrayed the left of the party and the center of the party. And they did it obviously openly out there in the front. But like the other Lenin, these guys, they made their judgment. But in the end, the betrayal was as big a loss as what the right did in, say, 1914 of the SPD. Yeah. So I think it's important that he calls it a betrayal. It just seems like a, a strong word to use. But it's something that we should think about why he's saying that. Well, and to be clear, too, the betrayal wasn't necessarily doing October at all, but in that in order to save the revolution, they, you know, built up a secret police and a militarized one state party and broke strikes and did all kinds of things that were very unbecoming of a socialist in order to maintain power. The gamble was that eventually somebody would come to aid them and it didn't pan out, obviously. Yeah, they destroyed the revolution to save it. You gotta crack some eggs. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you gotta crack some eggs to destroy some eggs. I had 12 eggs. I had to crack some eggs to crack the eggs. So I cracked the eggs and the eggs were cracked. It worked out fine. Now, and then instead of making an omelet, you just kind of throw the eggs away and tell each other it's fine. Don't even worry about it. I made it into an omelet and then I ate it. And it was, <laughs> it was a bit crunchy, but it was grand. <laughs> we don't live in a perfect world, people. I was on like a uh, Twitter and like some Stalinist was asking me, why don't I get the ML CPGB people on? I'm like, God, oh yeah. my God, here we go. And then like you, you have to, to make an omelet, you have to crack a few eggs. It didn't take long for that to come out. I don't know if he explicitly said that, but I think he might have. Right. Like, oh, I mean, God, here we go. I don't really want any of these people or Robespierre preparing my omelets. It sounds like they would get tons <laughs> of shell in them. They're not careful. It sounds like they make a shitty omelet. Well, yeah. I think it's also kind of damning too that McNair compared Stalinism to Bonapartism. It's accurate, but Lenin hated Bonapartism. <laughs> Trotsky's usage of Marx's comparison. You know, it should be sort of like drawn out a bit more what quote Bonapartism quote is. It's sort of an under, it's an underdeveloped concept. And I think a lot of state theorists just believe that the, that's what the state does. They're like a big Bonaparte all the time. They have their own sort of emergent collective interest. And it's worth investigating. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and The Night of the Purple Moon by Sunra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening. Please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit and Swampside Chats. Music